Thanks again for joining us here today at the 2020 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive, Ed, er, Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Craft Analytics Group. My name is Matt Cabrera. I'm a second year MBA student at MIT. And it's a pleasure for me to introduce today's talk, Rushing to Hockey Analytics, Hockey's Ability to Predict and Project Talent. Brought to you by uh, Megan Cheka, the uh, CEO and co-founder of Stathletes. So with that, I'll uh, toss it over to Megan. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, and maybe I'll start off with because it kind of relates to something I'm wearing. Who remembers the drunk and the light post comment on a hockey panel? Who is that? Do you remember? Brian Burke. So my first ever panel I did was probably seven years ago. And I was wearing my tag and I came off the, uh, the stage. And he said, hey, Megan, are you new? We all know who you are. You're wearing, you know, you're talking in front of all these people. So I always have to take it off just because, you know, it's like a superstitious thing. So with that said, we're going to go through a case study using multi-level models to estimate skater contributions. And I promise I'll try to make it fun. So before we get into that, we have to define what actually a rush shot is. So for a definition, an opportunity that occurs within four seconds of a controlled zone entry without the puck ever dropping below the goal line. So that's our definition for today that we're going to look at this model on. Kind of hockey. As we know, hockey is a very dynamic game. Typically in the past has been hard to quantify, but we're seeking to do a better job. Uh, basically, Stathletes, we started about 12 years ago. My brother, who's now the youngest uh, president GM in sports, and Neil Lane started just having fun with data. Um, I guess a year after MIT Sloan Conference started. And now we track in 22 leagues worldwide. And I heard earlier there wasn't a lot of public data for draft, but we actually have an extremely extensive uh, draft database and we track now and have clients in all these different levels. So hockey is definitely catching up in many different ways. And I'm happy to show you a bit more about that. So here's like event type data, just to give you a better picture of the type of data that's going into some of these models that we'll talk about further uh, into this presentation. And you can see there's positives, negatives, there's deflections, there's different types of occurrences and events, sub-event types. Um, you can see a play's made, received, moving ahead. There's someone missing coverage, so who's negatively de detracting from a play? And all of our, and here's a 2D projection as well, all of our data that we'll be talking about today is five on five, so even strength. Um, and it'll be, our objective is to evaluate individual contributions. So typically in the past, it's always looking at team level, but we really want to get down to that individual uh, rush shot volume, which is pretty obvious, the amount, but also quality. So when you think of quality, you think of maybe soccer, expected goals. So looking everything into what creates uh, these shot attempts and goal scoring chances, both offensively and defensively. Um, we're going to focus on offense because I think that's a bit more exciting for people. Uh, but defensively is interesting too because in the past that hasn't been as quantified. So the more data that you collect, the more tracking data you have, the more you're able to understand the defensive side. And especially, we want to provide measures of uncertainty. So if a researcher or someone that's up on this podium is doing perhaps a marketing type talk, um, presents point estimates without associated standard errors, they're either being lazy, it happens, or deceitful, which we don't want to do in the talk today. And this will be three years of NHL data in complete um, observations. So well, we also want to know how wrong we are. So without understanding how uncertain we are, we fail to determine if measured differences in our statistics are meaningful. Even worse, we tend to be overconfident in our results and could actually increase our risk in decision making. So if the top ranked skater and an average skater have confidence bounds that significantly overlap in a given performance, we cannot make a substantial claim about the former. 
We need standard errors to be able to tell when we are dealing with an arbitrarily ranked list of names. So if you see media and you're like, I wonder why that player is so high, they probably shouldn't be. Or a meaningful ordering of skater contributions and talent, which we're trying to get to. So to do that today, we're looking at a mixed effects regression. So this assumes that there exists a true underlying probability distribution that generates rush opportunities. This model is an idealized and simplified form of the data generating process. With this machinery, we can mess around with parameters. For example, who's on the ice, the score situation, zone starts, and simulate new rush opportunities that mimic real world outcomes. This helps also with model diagnostics. Does the model produce simulations that resemble reality and ultimately helps us gain insights on real world rush results, which is very important. So for example, what would happen if this player had average line mates? The model also accounts for teammate quality, competition, zone starts, score situation, and home ice advantage. In effect, we can now have a true individual statistic that isn't confounded by contextual factors. Additionally, these estimates are accompanied by measures of uncertainty. Along the way, the model estimates the distribution from NHL individuals are selected. So say if there's a small difference in defensive ability between skaters, we would be able to account for that. Also, understanding this distribution can inform us on the rarity of exceptional individuals, which we will get into. So we made many different assumptions. Some are extremely important, some are just up there, such as skater effects are multiplicative, uh, rush shot quality for and against are independent and conditionally follow lo logit normal distributions. Um, one really important one is that skaters are assumed to be league average. This only changes when conflicting evidence accumulates and a benefit is that we avoid drawing extreme conclusions from small sample sizes. So especially with hockey, where there are some occurrences that are very rare in games, you don't want to make these big lists or statements on those type of statistics. So this can be characterized as a conservative approach and is not quite that fun or has the huge sizzle, but I feel like it's great to talk about. And is best summarized by the quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So we'll get into the log normal distribution that we're looking at. Basically that NHL tater, skater talent can be modeled with this. So the idea is this is what it looks like. You see league average. Most skaters make small impacts one way or another. Makes sense. There's a lot of good hockey players. A small portion of skaters are exceptionally bad. And I'm sorry if you have them, you should probably trade them. We probably all know who they are in this room. I know we see them on Twitter time and time again every night. A small portion of skaters are exceptionally good. It's great if you have them. You know the superstars, the elite. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. So getting to that variables in the rush volume model. Pretty self-explanatory. Number of rush chances created for each continuous stint where the same 10 skaters are on the ice and they are the predictors. Similar to the rush quality model, except we're looking at expected goals. And as I said with that calculation, there's a lot of data that goes in behind that. And having it be accurate um, and having the sample size that matters is incredibly important. And at Stathletes, as a company, you know, we've taken a lot of time and effort um, into collecting a decade of data the right way, doing the little things that add up in the long run to make great data very accurate um, and be able to collect it in such detail that it's meaningful in hockey. So, for the model results. We're looking at rush, chance creation, and suppression. To create a rush off an ozone draw, a team would have to leave the ozone and re-enter. To account for this, the model reduces the expected rate of rush chances shortly following ozone draws. The effects of zone starts diminish as time goes on following the start of the stint, and you can see that in this graph. But to get into more exciting type of modeling, we're gonna look at forwards with rush offense. And we see it there uh, plotted as a histogram. You can see there's a couple outliers. Possibly a mistake? No, it's just Connor McDavid <laughs> doing his thing. 
And we're going to look at Connor McDavid a little bit more. Um, and I've kind of layered in a couple of tracking. There's a way to look at the landmarks, the 2D, uh, as you'll watch the play. And this is, uh, <laughs> you know, we could just have 25 minutes of us watching highlights, right? I don't even have to talk. So really, when you see that level of elite, eliteness, you realize that, yeah, it's a small tail, and maybe a few are out there, but it's certain with data that we can show you just how elite he is. Note that the whiskers show a range that has a 95% of containing their true talent level. So someone like Gaudreau and maybe McKinnon, who's right at the bottom, are interchangeable since their intervals overlap for the most part. So no use in, in you know, having these debates on Twitter about nine-tenths of this list. There's one, and then there's the rest. This is nice to know. Here's to uh, effect on 5v5, even strength, rush, uh, expected goals for. So now we get into model simulation and the importance of line mate quality. And one benefit of this model is that we can simulate hypothetical r rush results for specific groups of skaters. So you can imagine the amount of people that want us to simulate a certain player with average teammates. And of course, we have to, I have no idea why, default to Zach Cassian, who just signed for $12.8 million. And this is the second conference I've been making fun of him. But he makes $12.8 million, and he could be up here making fun of me. <laughs> So we need to know that he plays a significant share of his ice time with Dreisaitl, a German, leading the league, Conor McDavid, second in the league, elite, elite players, goal scorers. So the question is, how would his results change with average line mates in their place? And the great thing about analytics is we can actually simulate that. So we'll watch it. Uh, you know, total five on five ice time, minutes at the bottom and expected goals off the rush per 60 minutes. And the simulation, I think, is pretty obvious. You see the difference? Uh, Cassian, McDavid, Drysaddle in blue. Cassian average teammates in red. So on ice, rush expected goals rate drops by 41% with average line mates. That's $12.8 million there for you. But to end, I would also like to keep giving a hat tip to Connor McDavid, identifying generational talent with these three years of data. As I said, though, we collect extensive junior data, so we've actually been able to model him back to his Erie Otter days and find you know, what makes him unique going straight through junior into now his NHL career. So it's really cool to have that robust of a data set that we're able to look at him not only you know, as a elite scorer in the NHL, but as a young teenager, and see the impact that he has made over the years. So there's a 95% chance that Connor McDavid's impact on the rate of rush expected goals is greater than 44%. So with that, how often would we expect to see a skater as dominant on the rush as McDavid? Conservatively, we would expect to observe a rush talent as good as Connor McDavid based on the data once for every 7,500 skaters to play in the NHL. Now, how many players have you think have played ever? It's, it's yellow numbers. It's pretty close. Any other guesses? 11,000? 7,000 skaters have graced the ice in the league's history. So, that leaves us to say, that we may never see another rush talent like Connor McDavid in our lifetime. And that's exactly how I want to end this presentation. You know, hockey is a great game, a very international game, and I hope that I've inspired a few of you, whether you're, you know, NFL, football, baseball, to come over to the dark side and help us develop more Connor McDavid's. Thank you. I guess we can take questions too if you have a sure. Where, where does all that tax play by play data come from? It's in NHL API and not all that's in there. <laughs> 
Yes, so we've created software over the years. Honestly, it probably started 12, 13 years ago. We started with our first idea of how to speed up the process of uh, tagging and collecting better data. And then we've been trying to automate every sort of process that we can straight down to like locations of every players, um, different observations, and trying to be um, as detailed as possible and not like put our ideas of what certain plays are, but just put the location in an event and then allow um, you know, algorithms to define what those event types are. Great question. Thank you for being here too. I love seeing younger people. Um, yeah, of course, there's all sorts of ways that you can look at data, especially when you have a, um, you know, when you're looking at the game from not just a box score, which is traditionally looking at, you know, scoring chances. So when you have all the other types of movements and events that have happened, uh, you know, could be in the defensive zone, could be with a defenseman, you can do models that uh, answer any question you would like to have with maybe some uncertainty or a lot of uncertainty, but you can get a great answer for sure. Any other questions? Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't have it within this presentation, but there's definitely uh, a certain amount of rush goals versus, you know, goals that are in set plays, even like a certain amount of goals that happen after, um, you know, you enter the offensive zone. And I think it actually declines with how long you've been in the offensive zone um, for your chance at getting a goal. So rush chances and chances of like, you know, having goalie movement and, you know, different types of passing all increase your expected goals. So your ability to score goals. <laughs> He's easy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do those type of calculations, but with the caveat that it just matters depending upon what the team is looking for. So maybe within that line, um, you know, he's the type of player that will go into the corners and have certain skill sets that someone like a Connor McDavid either is lacking or doesn't have the physicality for. So it's not that you would like rank them per se, but for a team, that's maybe how you can build a line combination that ends up with, uh, you know, overall goal of how you, the style of play that you want. Right. We break it down exactly by location, so it can be as detailed as you want, which I think makes it really powerful too, because as you said, yeah, the first example is just like a really fun, like exciting highlight, but there's a lot that happens in terms of different types of rush opportunities. Sure. For sure, and I think that's incredibly important, which is why it's great that we collect data for you know, years and years on junior type player, and we can see like the different style of play and what actually translates into the NHL, look at specific skill sets, and also like follow their career as well. Um, if there's areas that they either decline in or increase in, depending upon who they're playing with, who they're playing, what team they're playing on, and you know, what type of uh, college program or even national program did they play on, it's important. Okay, great. Well, thank you for all the questions. Um, and yeah, go Connor McDavid.